Let's get started. I forgot to turn the front light out. Oh, pop, 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 pop. You're probably getting good at that. All right. It is Wednesday. The week, as of right now, is half over. And I guess in the middle of this lecture, it'll truly be half over for all of us. Um, Let's see, where am I? Uh, today I'm going to finish up talking about talking about talking about talking about membrane transport. And um, then we're going to turn to uh, the mitochondria, where we're going to see membrane transport is critical to the function of the mitochondria. So understanding how membrane transport happens with ions is something that um, will be important to understand mitochondrial function. So we're going to spend some time talking about that today. Uh, last time I got started talking about P-type ATPases. And P-type ATPases are one type of membrane transporter that move ions uh, across membranes. The one I talked about was a calcium transporter. Um, and there are other things that uh, transport calcium as well. And I'll tell you about another one of those uh, later today. Um, there's another class of transporters that's out there called ABC, trans uh, ABC transporters. And I'll briefly show you that and also give you an example uh, of that. But before I do that, I want to sort of mix things up a little bit because, again, your book doesn't quite go through them in, in I think, a sort of a logical order. And that order is uh, right now to talk a little bit about um, another P-type ATPase. Okay? The other P-type ATPase on there is the sodium-potassium ATPase uh, right here. And I want to spend a minute talking about that. Your book talks about it, and, but mysteriously does not... Um, show a figure for it. And this is one of the most important uh, transporters. Its general mechanism is the same as you saw for the calcium um, ATPase above. It's a P-type transporter. Uh, but I'd like to describe it uh, for you, or at least discuss it, show you a figure for it, because this is a very, very critical uh, transporter. This transporter is found in the surface of virtually every cell that's out there. And it plays a very, very important role in balancing osmotic balance for a cell. Okay? So osmotic balance is important. Um, if we think about cells, we think about cells have membranes surrounding them, and those membranes surrounding them have proteins in them. We think about those experiments we did back in basic biology where we took a uh, section of dialysis tubing and we put some things inside of it that could not diffuse out. They couldn't make it out through the pores. If we do that, what we see, we put it in solution, is the dialysis tubing starts taking on water. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger because those things inside can't diffuse out. If you let it go long enough, that dialysis tubing will ultimately burst, okay? Because the pressure is such that that um, uh, osmotic pressure will actually overcome uh, the, the strength of the tubing. Well, cells have a similar problem. Cells don't let their proteins and so forth go uh, bounding about them. So if cells didn't have a way of balancing the osmotic pressure, then they too would burst. Okay? Well, one of the ways that cells balance their osmotic pressure is by use of this sodium potassium ATPase. So I want to spend a minute talking about it. Okay? Cells um, use this ATPase to move both sodium and potassium ions. All right? I briefly mentioned it last time. This ATPase, as I said, is a P-type ATPase. It moves three ions of sodium out, and on the remaining part of the cycle moves two atoms of, or two ions, two atoms, same thing, of uh, potassium in. Okay? So you can see that the cell is playing with the osmotic concentrations of sodium and potassium, and that helps the cell to balance that osmotic pressure that it's feeling. The cell spends a fair amount of energy doing just this. If it doesn't do this, it will burst. It'll take on water and it will burst. And the reason it will burst is because the membrane of the cell, you remember one of the things that can cross the membrane freely is water. Water can come in across that membrane and will cause problems if the osmotic pressure is not right. Okay. Now, this uh, also shows another pump, and it shows another pump that is doing something with that sodium concentration. Okay. Now, you may remember last time I said that an active transport system, 
was a system that used, there, I'm sorry, it was a system that moved at least one molecule against a concentration gradient. Okay? If you remember that definition, at least one molecule against a concentration gradient. So I said we couldn't just use ATP as a way of deciding if we had active transport or not. We need to decide if we have at least one molecule moving against a concentration gradient. And that's exactly what's happening with this other transporter. So let me tell you what happens in the overall scheme. In this scheme, sodium is kicked out. That creates an artificial gradient. Sodium, as a result of being kicked out like this, is in higher concentration outside of the cell than it is inside of the cell. That sodium wants back in. Okay? That sodium coming back in is a force. Okay? Just like water uphill is a force, that sodium, hey, I was going, John. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, that sodium up, uh, outside of the cell is a force. Okay? So cells aren't stupid. They use forces to their advantage. And in this case, the force that they use is they use the incoming movement or the incoming desire of that sodium to come into the cell as a way of dragging with it something that doesn't want to come in. In this case, glucose. Okay? So glucose is being moved in this case against a concentration gradient. The driving force is a gradient of sodium. Okay? It's not a diffusion process. Sodium is in essence diffusing, but it's dragging with it something that doesn't want to come across. That's the glucose. Okay? So that gradient of sodium is being used as an energy source to bring in glucose. We're going to see that ion gradients are very, very good energy sources, especially when we talk about the mitochondria. So what you see on the screen here are two different active transport systems. The second one relies on the first one. If this gradient doesn't work, what happens to the concentration of sodium ions? It's going to even out, right? And when it evens out, then there's not going to be any driving force to bring in the glucose, and the cell is going to sit there and do nothing. The cell is also going to have to worry about bursting at that point, right? OK. Um, I want to introduce a couple of terms for you at this point also that you will see relative to this. This transporter on the left is a transporter that we call an antiport, A-N-T-I-P-O-R-T. -T. An antiport is a transporter that moves molecules in opposite directions. So in this case, the sodium is moving out, the potassium is moving in. The transporter on the right is known as a symport. And you'll actually see this spelled two different ways depending upon the textbook that you look in. S-Y-M as in Mike, P-O-R-T, or S-Y-N as in Nancy, P-O-R-T. I'll take either. Okay? That is a, a transport system that moves both ions, or both, I'm sorry, both molecules in the same direction. Yeah? I'm sorry? Uh, is glut a sodium glucose supporter? No, it's not. Gluts are not. So, so there are many different transporters of different molecules, but, this is, but there's not a sodium glucose transporter. Okay, now, um, one other term I'll give you that you'll hear associated with these, and I'll come back to your question. One other term I want to give you is something called an ionophore. Okay? An ionophore is something that moves an ion. So these are both ionophores because you see a sodium ion. In this case over here, you see a potassium ion and a sodium ion. So ionophore is just simply that moves an ion across a membrane. Yes, sir, you had a question? Yeah, is the uh, transporter on the right a P-type? Is the transporter on the right a P-type? It's not, because a P-type would use ATP. Okay, what's, like, what's the similar That's on the left. Yeah. But this, this, this one is a P-type. This one over here doesn't use ATP. So the one on the right does not use ATP. Is a good definition of what? Well, the definition is it's a structural definition, and it's a mechanistic definition. For our purposes, uh, the only things that you will have to worry about being P-type transporters are those, uh, when you hear that, you would associate with uh, um, phosphoaspartate, because they use a phosphorylated intermediate of aspartate during their, their, uh, uh, reaction, during their transport mechanism. OK? Other than that, you'd have to look at one and say, oh, yeah, that's a, a P-type. OK. so.
That's a bunch of terminology there. I want to turn our attention uh, for the moment to a, another um, class of transporters. These are known as the ABC type transporters. And again, for our purposes, you're just going to look at it and say, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an ABC type. We're not worried about the structures here, but, but we should obviously recognize that they are fundamentally different structures and they have fundamentally different mechanisms than P type transporters. ABC transporters also use ATP as an energy source. Okay? And the ATP binding sites are shown there in blue. And an example of an ABC, excuse me, of an ABC type transporter is a very interesting protein known as multi-drug resistance protein, okay? Or MDR. Okay? Multi-drug resistance protein is a, um, uh, an important consideration in certain uh, cancers. It's been long known that certain types of chemotherapy work very well at first, and after a while, they stop working. And there was quite a puzzle about how it was that cells became resistant to the chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic drug that they were getting, and it turned out that there is, in the, that there is a uh, protein that's involved in expelling from cells okay, compounds that are hazardous to the cell. Well, you can imagine that a chemotherapeutic drug is fairly, cancer, is fairly hazardous to a cancer cell. That's why it was designed. And the multi-drug resistance protein is actually doing what it was supposed to do, which is protect cells. Unfortunately, the cell it's protecting in this case is a cancer cell. So that's a consideration in certain types uh, of therapy. And oh, I should also say, this is an interesting, drug, an interesting uh, protein in that it's not very specific. It will take a wide variety of things across the membrane. So we think of the other transporters I've talked about, like uh, the ones that say move glucose but won't move fructose, for example, as those being very specific for specific molecules. Multidrug resistant protein is not very specific. It works on a wide variety of drugs and will kick it out uh, of those cells. I'm not going to go through the mechanism of that drug, so uh, we're not going to sweat that. Okay. Uh, symporters, antiporters, I've already shown you that. Okay. Um, we're not going to talk about uniporters. And um, I just show you this one to give you another example of a transport system that uses a gradient of ions as a driving force to move things across a membrane. This particular uh, transporter is called a, um, a lactose permease. It's very important in bacterial cells for getting lactose into them. You remember E. coli, uh, or maybe you don't remember, but E. coli uh, can use lactose as uh, an energy source. We'll actually say a little bit more about that later this term. And lactose, of course, has to be moved across the membrane in order for that to happen. This uh, transporter plays an important role in that process. You'll see that um, a um, driving force uh, for this is a proton. And the proton itself, if we look at this, uh, comes in in an interesting way. It, it binds to a carboxyl group that's on the transporter itself. That change in charge of the carboxyl group causes a conformational change in the transport protein, which allows it to bind to lactose. Lactose, as a consequence of that, uh, can bind and cause a conformational change of its own, which allows the um, um, transport protein to ultimately push it in. This is moving against the concentration gradient, so this is, in fact, an active transport system. Lactose is deposited into the cell, and upon that depositing, the proton comes off and is released, as you can see here, and the transporter goes back to its original state. This system relies on a proton gradient. So again, higher concentration of protons on the outside are the driving force to make this overall process work. And the uh, system is, a, is a, an active transport system because, again, lactose is being moved against the concentration gradient. Yes, sir? If E. coli is unicellular, how does it perform a proton gradient? It's a good question. Uh, unicellular organisms have pumps as well. And they use pumps kind of like we do in mitochondria. So what we think about what happened with mitochondria, E. coli as individual cells can do, it's a bit more complicated because as you can imagine, 
E. coli is all there by itself. It doesn't have a lot of surrounding things like a, like a cytoplasm to help hold those protons in. So it's not as efficient of a system or not a as efficient of a way of getting it in, but it works. Its environment will definitely influence its ability to do that. As you can imagine, in an acidic environment, it's going to be much more able to do this than if it's not in an acidic environment. Absolutely. Yes, uh, Danielle. So it's, it's working against the concentration of the gradient. That's correct. Oh, or will it just kind of you know, I don't. I think that's. <laughs> I didn't even realize it was on there. I think that, that, that that's a, a misprint. So so yeah, this this has already gone by this point. So that that shouldn't even be there. Good eyes, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't come back and regrab a lactose. No, no. Sorry. You guys are observing. <coughs> Absent-minded professor didn't see that on the on the figure. But that's uh, that that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Okay. Here we got it. All right. So. <coughs> Excuse me. So we see a little bit about how ions and ion gradients um, can cause, in fact, um, uh, or be used as an energy source. Uh, one of the interesting things medically I want to talk about is uh, this compound here, digitoxygenin. Okay? Digitoxygenin is um, an interesting um, compound. It is chemically uh, related it's, it, uh, to um, vitamin D. In other words, it has a slight resemblance to vitamin D and also to uh, cholesterol, which are, which are also both related. Um, but this compound is uh, of interest not because of its relationship to those compounds, but rather because of its um, ability to block the sodium-potassium ATPase. So it blocks the sodium potassium ATPase, and you might think, oh, wow, so it's going to kill cells. And if you put it in high enough concentration, it will kill cells. However, in low concentrations, um, it turns out to be a very good heart stimulant. And it's used uh, for people who are having congestive heart failure and other problems associated with weakness of their heart. Now, in order to understand how that works, I need to uh, give you just a little bit more background to show you uh, what's happening um, with what this thing does. Okay? So this compound, as I said, inhibits the sodium-potassium ATPase. Now, if I inhibit the sodium-potassium ATPase, what's going to happen to the concentration of sodium that, that we've been thinking about being built up? It's not going to build up, right? Okay. So it turns out that that sodium buildup, that sodium concentration, which I showed you earlier, can be used to bring in glucose into the cell can also be used by heart cells to do something interesting. Okay? What heart cells do is they use a sodium gradient to expel calcium. So heart cells use a sodium gradient as an energy source to expel calcium. Now, why is that important? Well, from what we've been saying, calcium, of course, is important for muscular contraction. Heart is in the muscular contraction business. So if the cell can't get rid of calcium, what do you suppose the heart cell is going to do? It's going to contract, right? So if I give digita digi uh, digitoxygenin to a patient who's having difficulty with a heart beating strong enough, those heart cells will not be able to pump out as much sodium. The gradient will be lower. So there'll be less sodium on the outside. The lower sodium gradient means there's going to be less calcium kicked out of the cell. So calcium will stay in the heart cell longer, and that heart cell is going to do more work than it would do otherwise. It's going to contract harder. So digitoxygenin is a heart stimulant for people, and it's used for people who are having uh, problems with a weak heart, congestive heart failure, and so forth. Now, it usually generates a few questions, so I'll slow down at that point and take them. Shannon. Is it just heart cells that calcium? It's not just heart cells, but it's the heart cells that we focus on, yes. Yeah. So was it a stronger contraction? Or it gives a stronger, longer contraction is what it does. Yep. Yes, sir. Does it have any effects on any other cells in the body? It probably does have other effects on other cells in the body, but again, uh, the, the heart is the target. Yes, sir. It's also have something to do 
faster? Yeah, there are other electrical considerations relating to uh, ion charges across the membrane, and uh, that actually leads into something I'm going to talk about with respect to nerve cells. So if you let me do that, I'll do that. But I, I, I can't tell you um, if it affects that circuitry. I, I don't know that, to be honest with you. Yes? Can you go back to the sodium-potassium mm -hmm. slide and talk about yes. the Sure. Okay, so going back to that slide, um, which was this guy right here, okay? There's the sodium potassium ATPase that's affected. Remember, I'm not talking about this transporter. So this transporter you would expect might be affected as well. What would happen to the ability of this cell to bring in glucose? It would go down, okay? So there's maybe a trade-off here to think about too, right? You want glucose for energy. But if the, if the heart cell, and heart is unusual in the kinds of energy sources that it uses, so it's not totally reliant on glucose, and this may be uh, an important consideration here. Now, did you have a question about that, Stephanie? Or? No, I just, it, it didn't quite make sense to me when you were talking about the glucose, and then I thought if you talked about it with this slide, that would make more sense. Okay, so the digitoxygenin, as I said, inhibits this sodium potassium ATPase. The way that it works is it actually inhibits the dephosphorylation that occurs during the mechanism of this p-type ATPase. If you remember the p-type ATPase, there was a step where we made that phosphoaspartate. And a necessary way of regenerating the original starting material was that phosphate had to be taken off of that aspartic acid. Digitoxygenin inhibits the ability of the um, uh, um, enzyme that would normally, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the ability of the phosphate to be removed from that transporter. So since the transporter is stuck with a phosphate on it, it can't go all the way through the cycle. It's stuck where it is. And when it's stuck, of course, it can't move any more sodium or potassium ions. Shannon? So is this a short-term short drug? Or is it like when they're in failure, when do they use it? It's used uh, relatively short-term. So it's used as a stimulant when they're having a real problem. There are other stimulants that are used if you're having like a heart attack. Uh, also short-term epinephrine being one of them and uh, others that are there as well. But this is, used, uh, this is approaching something very different than what epinephrine is doing. Okay. Let's see. So I think that's what I want to say there. Let's uh, turn our attention now and talk about neurotransmission. Okay. So neurotransmission is uh, an important uh, consideration. And it does relate to ionic charges across a membrane. Ionic charges across the membrane are um, critical for transmitting a nerve signal. All right? So nerve cells are, uh, I like to think of them as little electrical circuits. And that little electrical circuit goes from one point to another point, And then there's a junction where that information has to be transmitted across from one nerve cell to the other nerve cell, ultimately making it back to the brain or spinal cord uh, to do its thing, that transmission is literally an electrical signal. That electrical signal, as we shall see, is a chemical gradient of ions. Ions, of course, being charged, are electrical in nature. OK, so what this figure is showing you is that if we take uh, an individual nerve cell and we stimulate the nerve cell to signal, what we will see is we will see a great change in charge across the nerve cell. We will see a recovery of uh, that charge. And then we'll see the nerve eventually go back to the place where it started. So when we think of neural transmission, that is the movement or the, the, um, the signaling of a nerve cell, there's really three things that we have to consider in that signaling process. They're all electrical in nature. Okay. Now, um, that's not what I want. Uh, oh, and I don't think I've got it here. That's not it. That's not it. Oh, I thought I had it. I don't have that. Okay, well, let me just describe it to you. So, I've got a nerve cell, okay? How does a nerve cell work? Well, first of all, I've told you that a nerve cell works 
by, by using ions to, to make an electrical signal. All right? So if I have just a regular cell sitting here and I start kicking sodiums out and bringing potassiums in, you'll notice I'm putting three sodiums out and two potassiums in, right? Is the charge neutral? No, because I'm getting three pluses out, two pluses in, so each time I go through the cycle, I'm putting one more positive charge outside the cell, right? If I have a charge gradient across the membrane, that is an electrical potential. That's what an electrical potential is, a charge gradient across that membrane. More positive charges outside than inside. That charge gradient okay, is useful for energy purposes, and as we shall see, it's useful for what nerve cells actually do. So just like regular cells pump sodium out and potassium in, so too do nerve cells pump sodium out and potassium in. All right. So they have that sodium potassium ATPase, and they're totally reliant upon this in order to transmit nerve signals. A nerve cell can be fairly long. Okay? We can have a nerve cell several feet long in some cases. So what I'm going to tell you is going to surprise you. Okay? If we look at the transmission of information that that nerve cell is doing, that is the signaling that it's doing, here's what's happening. Imagine I have a nerve cell on the end of my finger. And I take that finger and I stick it into a flame. Okay? Not a smart thing to do. But I stick it into a flame, what's going to happen? Well, that nerve cell is going to go, whoa, got to get some information to the brain so this idiot gets his hand out of the flame. Okay? So this nerve cell has to send a signal, and ideally that signal is going to go very quickly. The things that I'm talking to you about here will occur on the order of milliseconds, thousands of a second. Okay? How does the nerve cell tell the brain that this guy's got his finger in a, in a fire? Okay? Well, what happens is the nerve cell has on it two gates that are specific for ions. All right? They're gates. They can open and they can close. There's no active transport necessary because there's a concentration gradient for the ions that move across these gates. One gate is specific for sodium and one gate is specific for potassium. All right? So before I have stuck my finger in the flame, my the nerve cell is sitting there reading Facebook or something like that, doing nothing. Okay? And all of a sudden, that signal is there. That signal causes, first of all, one of the gates to open up. The gate that opens first is the sodium gate. So it's like taking the doors to this room and opening every door all at once. And we are sitting at the bottom of the ocean. What's going to happen to the water uh, that was being held out by the doors? Well, of course, the water is going to come rushing in. The, so the sodium is coming rushing in. It's coming rushing in because we had a gradient of sodium. What's going to happen to the voltage as we see that happen? Well, it's going to go up or down depending upon whether it's plus or minus according to the graph that we saw there. It goes up reflecting the fact that sodium is rushing in. Okay? The sodium rushing in, the cell is sitting there going, whoa! What's the first thing you're going to do when you try to have, when you've got this water rushing in? What's the fir your first reaction? We've got to do something about this water rushing in, right? Okay. So why don't we pull the plug in the drain here, okay, and let out whatever we can? Well, the plug that we're pulling is letting out, okay, as so we're trying to adjust, we're trying to get some balance here. The cell has said there's a whole bunch of positive ions coming in. I've got to get rid of some positive ions. It opens the second gate and lets out potassium, which are also positive ions. Now, this happens very rapidly also because potassium is in higher concentration inside than outside, and it goes shooting out. The voltage which went, went way up now goes way back down. Okay? Now, is the cell where it needs to be? No. Because now the cell has got all this sodium in there, and it's got all that potassium out there. What's got to happen for the cell to get back to its original state? It's got to reverse that process. It's got to kick all that sodium back out. It's got to bring all that potassium back in. So the next step it does is it closes the gates. The gates close, and that sodium potassium ATPase takes over and goes back about its business of kicking the sodium out, bringing the potassium in. And during that period of recovery that we saw, we go back to the action potential. So here we go. Let's go back here. 
we saw the sodium come in, we saw the potassium go out, and here we are now in what's called the recovery phase where the sodium potassium ATPase is getting everything back to its original state. We could imagine in this room that we brought in a bunch of pumps, closed the doors, and started pumping things appropriately so that the water that came in wouldn't stay here. Okay, does that make sense? Now, what I've just told you is how the signal starts. I didn't tell you how the signal traveled all the way down the nerve cell. That's how we start the signal. Okay? Well, how do we get this thing to move several feet down the nerve cell all right, and get that information to the brain before the guy burns his finger, or this guy being me, burns my finger off? Okay, I'm talking about myself in the third person here. When I talk about idiots, I like to make sure that people think it's not me. So, okay? How do we get that signal down there very quickly? All right? Now, this is the part that's really cool. What's cool is, let's think about what happened at the very end of this cell, at the very end of this nerve cell. I saw that I had a lot of sodium come in. I saw a lot of potassium go out. Okay? I closed the gate, and I've got a nerve cell that goes all the way along here. Well, it turns out that all the way along this nerve cell, I've got other gates, just like the ones that were at the very tip. All right? And those gates are very, very, very sensitive to ionic change. That electrical signal that started here changed the distribution of sodium and potassium ions not too far away. And during that recovery phase, okay, during that recovery phase, those guys are moving down the nerve cell and triggering the same process happening over and over and over and over and over. Okay? Each time it gets to the next place, the gates open. Okay? The same thing happened as before. We have a recovery phase, moves, 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 moves. This happens on the order of milliseconds. Okay? Now that is pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable, remarkable phenomenon. But without that, we can't respond as quickly as we need to to pain, danger, and so forth, and keep us from, cells from getting hurt. Yes, sir? Are these gates within a single cell? These gates are within a single cell. That's correct. So these gates are all in a single cell. I haven't talked about how I moved from one cell to the next. I'll do that in a minute. OK, so the original thing you described is happening all within Starting at the end. That's right. OK? Yes, Danielle. That's what your brain does. So it depends, it depends on where it hits you in the brain. And the brain says, ah, feels good. Ah, feels bad. <laughs> Some people mix those up, too. You got <laughs> I'm sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> right. So everything that you see, everything that you sense in the world is ultimately painted. That picture or that feeling or whatever is painted by the brain. Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. It could. Uh, so what would be, so it'd be a good exam question. What, what, what effect would you expect that might have if you use it at a high enough concentration? Well, no, wait. Think about this. Think about what, what, would, what would happen. <coughs> predict based on what you see on this figure right here. I, I can tell you a prediction I'd make in a, in a second. So his question was, if, I, if this digitoxygenin comes along and affects nerve cells, what's going to happen? It would decrease impulse induction. How so? So it would actually lengthen the, uh, the period of time, the recovery phase. Right. So your ability to respond, you know, to reactivate the nerve cell to respond, would, would, would slow down. That's what would happen. OK? Make sense? If you were to completely inhibit it, in, indeed. But again, remember I said that we can't, we have to be careful in concentrations that we're using. But we would expect that if we had some around that that's going to lengthen the period of time it takes us, our ability to respond to that signal or get that signal. Okay? Okay, good. Yes, sir? What causes CIFA? I'm sorry? What causes CIFA? Causes what? CIFA. 
SIPA. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 I don't know. What about those with nerve damage, like if they can't feel something, uh -huh. if they can't feel their hand required, right. do they just lack the, um, are their pumps not working? Or? So nerve damage is, as its name implies, a damage to a nerve. It can happen in a variety of ways. So if you cut a nerve, all right, then that nerve is not going to be able to connect, send a signal to the brain. The brain's not going to know that. So that could happen at several different levels, paralysis, of course, being uh, the worst level at which that's happening. So uh, nerve damage would mean just that. It, nerve damage might be that you've cut it. It might mean that you have chemically damaged it. The nerve cell may have died, uh, et cetera. If you look at diseases like Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, nerve cells are preferentially dying uh, that control muscles. And so uh, that's just a, another severe type of nerve damage. Yes? Is Novocaine working on the same level as Digitoxin? No. Um, and I don't know the exact way that Novocaine works, but I will say something about cocaine uh, in a minute. So let me... Uh, <laughs> and I, there are rela chemical relations between them, so I, that, this may relate to that as well. Everybody's interested in drugs and, <laughs> and sadomasochists here today. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, let's talk about cocaine, all right? Uh, cocaine comes into play when we um, look at what happens as the impulse makes it to the end of one nerve cell and it has to communicate that impulse to another nerve cell, okay? Now, this uh, shows, so we can imagine that we're at the end of the nerve cell. So here's a nerve cell way up here that was in my finger, and maybe it's made it all the way down here in my arm somewhere. Here's the end of the nerve cell. It's got to communicate to the next nerve cell, which is going to ultimately communicate and carry this information back to my brain. Okay? How does that information get from the original nerve cell to the next nerve cell in this pathway? Well, it turns out that the um, um, way in which this information is moved is by mechanism called the use, or not a mechanism, by using molecules called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are small molecules that are released by one nerve cell. They act on an adjacent nerve cell and cause that signal to get started again. Okay? So, Let's imagine that I've got this nerve signal coming along, and I've got these neurotransmitters here. The neurotransmitters are just sitting here waiting at the end of the nerve cell. They're wrapped up in little bags we call synaptic vesicles. So the synaptic vesicle is just a little membrane-enclosed structure that has the nerve cell, has the, the uh, neurotransmitter inside of it. When this action potential, that is this voltage, this ion current that's coming down this nerve cell hits down here, it causes the synaptic vesicles to fuse with the end of the nerve cell. The fusing of the synaptic vesicle with the nerve cell causes the neurotransmitter to be expelled from inside of it. And this neurotransmitter now binds here, and guess what it does? It opens sodium gates which now bring, lets, lets in the sodium, which then opens the potassium gates, lets out the potassium. So exactly the same thing that happened on the first nerve cell happens as a result of the neurotransmitter binding to the second nerve cell. Yes, sir? So where does the sodium, does the sodium come from outside the cell and then it pushes the potassium that was inside the cell out of the cell? So, sodium doesn't do anything but come in. So there's not a relationship between sodium pushing or doing anything like that, no. It comes from the environment. I'm sorry? It comes from, yeah, because you've got, you've got fluids surrounding every cell in your body. Yeah. yeah. So that fluid is rich in sodium, and it's poor in potassium, which is why sodium rushes in, why potassium rushes out. Okay? Yes, Shannon? What causes tumor cells start at the beginning? Like, is it heat that causes... It's a good question. What caused the nerve cell to do that in the beginning? And it really depends on the nerve cell. So there are nerve cells that will respond, for example, to heat. There are nerve cells that will respond simply to touch some that respond to um, acid, okay? So there's different types of nerve cells and their stimulus is different. And the stimulus it has to do with opening the gates. That's right, the They're stimulus always has to do with opening the gates. We'll talk later in the term about like the sense of taste, the sense of smell, uh, vision and so forth, and they use very interesting mechanisms that are very similar to this. They're nerve, they're nerve endings as well. Yes? 
Do different neurotransmitters do what? What do you mean different portions of sodium in? Like for different electrical charge to for a certain type of test, I guess. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Uh, I mean like uh, that if, if, uh, if like a certain different types of neurotransmitters are asking for different types of uh, actions, uh, do they let in different amounts of, uh, of sodium in and potassium out? No. So do they let different amounts of sodium and potassium in? The answer is no. But they may affect different nerve cells. And it gets, when we get in the brain, it gets very complicated. And that's a little bit of what I, in the direction I'm getting right now. But we can have a neurotransmitter that might affect one nerve cell and not another nerve cell. And so that's more the way that we see the different signals that are, that are propagated. OK? All right. So this is how this thing jumps this junction. Well, this junction happens. We're from one nerve cell to another. In our brain, we use neurotransmitters to communicate different parts of our brain and so forth. And our brain is nicely set up with a reward system for us. We have a reward system in our brain that the question about does this make us feel good or uh, bad or whatever uh, really has to do with that reward system in the brain. And that reward system in the brain um, is what gives you that euphoric feeling. Okay? Maybe you're, you're, you're hungry. That's a feeling that, that the brain is saying, hey, I've got to get something to eat. Or the brain is saying, oh, wow, I just feel so good today. This is really nice. It's a beautiful day. I'm having a great day. This is really la, la, la. Uh, and that uh, is, is because of different transmitters that your brain is communicating with different parts there. So we're seeing this sort of release of neurotransmitters stimulating different parts of the brain. Well, how does, I said I was going to talk about cocaine. How does cocaine come into that? There are certain neurotransmitters that are associated with pleasurable feeling, okay? Sexual feeling, uh, the uh, sense of touch, the uh, sense of, uh, uh, you know, as I say, feeling about a good day, whatever you want to talk about. Our brain is saying, okay, do this, right? Well, cocaine is an addictive substance, and our brain gets addicted to that good feeling. Let's face it, we all want to feel good, right? We don't want to feel mopey almost of the time. It's nice if we can feel good, and cocaine has the effect of making people feel really good. Okay? Well, how does it work? It turns out that some of the neurotransmitters that are involved in the pleasure sense of the brain, they get released and they stimulate this part of the brain. The brain goes, ah, this is very, very nice. I feel very, very good. Well, I've only told you one part of the story about neurotransmitters. I haven't told you the second part. Once I get these neurotransmitters down into here, what are they going to do? Okay. Well, actually, they don't go in here. They just bind them to the surface. But what, once they get here, what do they do? Well, they have to be recycled back into the original nerve cell. If they're not, the nerve cell isn't going to have any more neurotransmitters to signal next time it needs to. So your nerve cells have a recycling system that takes those neurotransmitters off of the surface here, packages them back up, and puts them back in the original nerve cell. Okay, that's an important consideration for neurotransmitters. Cocaine inhibits the recycling of neurotransmitters involved in pleasure. Okay? So now, those neurotransmitters, instead of getting picked up here and put back up in this nerve cell, stay on the surface of here, and guess what they're doing? They're signaling, ah, ah, it feels good for a long time. It's an addictive substance because people like that feeling. They don't want to let that go. And as a consequence, cocaine really is a very difficult thing uh, to deal with because of that uh, tendency. Okay? So some of the strategies for breaking cocaine, um, cocaine uh, addiction uh, actually involves blocking cocaine's ability to stop that recycling. So if that recycling can occur, then the effect of cocaine goes away. And there are other types of addiction. There are other things that can happen with addiction as well. Yes? Do I know how ibogaine works? I don't. I'm sorry. Yes? Yeah, so how does it eventually go away? Well, over a long enough period of time, it will go away and it will uh, break down. So that's what happens with it. It's not a permanent thing because cocaine itself uh, it, it won't, won't be stable forever. But it will prolong that feeling because it's keeping the, those gates open a lot longer than they normally would be 
in the recycling system. Yes, Danielle. It's not holding them down. I don't want to say that. Okay, what cocaine is doing is preventing them from getting recycled. That's really what it's doing. It's an inhibitor of the recycling process. And then eventually it goes away and then they get recycled. That's right. So they get much more slowly recycled as a result. Yeah. Yes, one more, and then I've got to move on. Over time, they stop accepting it, and that's why people need to do more and more. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So is the, is the accumulative effect, you have to take more and more to get the high and so forth, is that a result of the fact that uh, your body is overcoming that? And in fact, that's exactly what happens. Um, and similar things happen with uh, nicotine addiction as well. Yeah. But not caffeine. Caffeine is different stuff. OK, I will take one more. Yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. Uh huh. Okay, so he's confused, I, I, and I understand your confusion. You're confused because you're saying, well, once I start letting the gates open, I break the, the gradient, then I've got, I'm back in this refractory period where there's not really a signal that's going to come through, right? Well, keep in mind that further down the line, what's happening with the other gates down here? What are they doing? They're opening, they're closing, they're actually recovering some of that potential, right? So that sort of backs up up to here so that this signaling now triggers them again. So that nerve cell, the nerve cell does um, get additional signaling that's happening because of the fact that, the co that, that the, those neurotransmitters aren't affecting the gates further down. Does that make sense? OK. OK. Well, I'll be consistent and let you guys out one minute early today. How about that? SSNRIs are the same type of thing, correct? Like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors? Like uh, yeah, yeah. So the only difference is that you're dealing with dopamine instead of serotonin? Right, right. I think so, so. same thing. So how come cocaine is bad for you then if they prescribe some... I, there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a whole course we could teach on okay. this. I, I, I honestly, I, I'm not an expert in this. I can't tell you. Okay. But uh, that blocking is critical. And that blocking is critical for a variety of, of treatments. It's, it's often used in many different types of... Um, uh, things for psychosis and so forth, yeah. because there's imbalances of those neurotransmitters. Yes? Um, I registered for an anatomy in the recitations at this time on Mondays, uh -huh. and I was wondering if you could sign this, and I would just miss the recitation in none of your class. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll, let me talk to you about that separately, okay? Uh, questions? I have a Let's couple go. questions. Yeah. So. Follow me up. <laughs> Uh-huh. For what? Uh, cocaine use. Yes. Does it...